Um, opposition and how to handle it. Okay. Uh, the problem that arises is this. People find themselves thinking, Christians find themselves thinking, and of course others find themselves thinking. Given that Christianity is so hard and faces such difficulty and frustration and opposition, can it possibly be right? Now, you, you can understand, you can identify the pattern of thought. Well, if it's that hard, how can it possibly be right? And, and there are times when, of course, we won't phrase it in those terms, but there are times when we can start to think like that too, as believers, if such we are. Okay? The key to it is working out the significance of the opposition that you face, it seems to me, from a spiritual perspective. Something's going wrong. Something's, there's grit in the machine. There's spanner in the works. What's going on here? When we make the mistake of thinking there's a spanner in the works, and that's the problem, there's a spanner and it's in the works. Mm, wait a minute, somebody's put that spanner in the works, what is it? What's it doing there? How's that happened? How's that arisen? Because we live in a universe that's in the hand of a God who's almighty, that's a difficult one, a God who is sovereign and allows or works out everything according to his perfect will, right? So if there's a spanner in the works, there's a reason that spanner's in the works. I'll give you a silly little illustration. I wound out my awning, which I had very valiantly put onto the roof rack myself uh, on Friday afternoon. Wound it all out, wound it back, and the bloody thing wouldn't shut. Now, there's a snag. <clears throat> there's a reason for that. And the difficulty for me was, I can't, I can't see what's wrong here. It was closing at both ends, but the middle wasn't closing. So we had a bit of, bit of a banana developing. In the, yeah, we don't want that. It'll bend it. So, you know, I needed somebody else to look at it, because I could not see what I had. I couldn't... I couldn't identify, I couldn't identify, let alone tell you the significance of the spanner that was in the works. And sometimes we do need that little bit of help with that. We do need our brethren around us. We do need, do need God's word open. We need to be praying, perhaps to see it. Sometimes we've got to trust him with that. On this occasion, I went down to see the bloke down in the works. And as you know, he was a very nice guy. And there we are, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it is, it is this here. He said, that's, that's fouling on that. Look, you just move it, move it like a quarter of an inch. <laughs> How annoying is that? And then... Yep, that makes sense. Identifying the significance, the source and the significance of the problem is a big deal. It's a big deal. And when you get that sort of opposition, and when it's in your face, and when it's very difficult then sometimes to work it out, just as I've been frustrated with this awning and I couldn't get the thing sorted, too close to it. From a spiritual perspective, this thing that's happening, this opposition you face, what does it actually show? What does it actually mean? Because the answer to that question is going to determine both what you make of the opposition and how you should rightly respond to it. Or it's going to drive you to wrongly respond to it. How do you respond to opposition? Well, where's it coming from? What's it about? What's it, what, what's this mean? There is no doubt that following Christ in this world will get you opposed, right? Because we live in the sort of world we inhabit, where Christ was opposed, and it is Christ we're following. So, it is, something is going right. This is bonkers, isn't it? Something is going right when you find you're being opposed. You're following a Jesus who in this sort of world, because of the sort of world it is, was opposed. There's no doubt that following Christ will get you opposed in this sort of world. But your answer to the question of why this is happening, what it means, where it's coming from, that's going to determine how you respond to that opposition. And the Lord gives us a big, worked-out example of that in the passage we're looking at today. Here's a worked example for you to have a look at. How to deal with opposition when it comes flying at you. Here's where the passage fits into the Gospel. <clears throat> this section of Mark's Gospel, at the start there, Mark 3, 13 to 35, you get the appointing of the 12 apostles. We saw that the other day. And you get opposition from family, opposition from religious leaders, opposition from family again. That is the introduction to this section. And then the middle part, maze in this, four parables and four miracles. Showing Jesus is the right one, Jesus is the way, Jesus is. And he's speaking truth and dealing with how you deal with opposition. How you to respond to a world that opposes you for following Jesus. Right? So... Opposition from family, opposition from religious leaders, opposition from family, again, we're doing today. But then, it's no accident, he goes straight on and he said, talks about the parable of the sower. A bit more about that at the end. Proving who Jesus is, proving he is the deal. And then, at the end of that section, opposition from family and friends again. Do you see how it's all bracketed with opposition? 
So if you want to understand the parable of the sower, the parable of the lamp, the parable of the seed growing secretly, the parable of the mustard seed, if you want to understand the stilling of the storm, the driving out legion, the healing of the sick woman, the raising Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, <gasps> it's all in between this bit of appointing people to go and serve him in the world and the opposition that results from it. Have we got that? Clean off my notes, but we've got to get that. Okay? If we don't get that, we're not going to get there. Jesus has come and he's preached that God's kingdom is at hand, so repent and believe the good news. It's a big ask. And Mark has shown how that fits in with centuries of Old Testament prophecy. But opposition begins to break out as soon as Jesus heals a paralytic by forgiving his sins. They won't have that. They don't like Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy before their very eyes. It doesn't fit their agenda. And him forgiving sins is a claim to be God and they don't like that either. Opposition comes from truth in a world hostile to God. And as that happens, Jesus immediately predicted a radical break with religiosity in that language we had the other day about new wine and new wineskins. Remember that? And immediately his followers must expect, expect opposition arising directly from the fact that they followed that Jesus. Arising directly from who he is and what he says and what he's about and what he does. If you follow that Jesus, you'll get the opposition that he got for being who he is, saying what he was and so on. Making sense? And then in this immediately following section, Jesus deals with this seemingly schizophrenic clash then between the power of the gospel and the opposition his followers face because they believe that gospel with the visible effect that they follow him that will get you into trouble now if you if you say you believe it but there's not the visible effect that you're following him you won't get that effect paul says doesn't he you know if you went for the cross of christ if you weren't preaching christ crucified the only way to be saved then you know we wouldn't be facing opposition yeah. here are the twelve appointed to take on his mission all subsequent disciples following on from that but immediately the way he shows them in which they will follow results in opposition contrary to expectation, contrary to nature and it is precisely against that background that the, the parables and the miracles again affirming who he is and explaining opposition arise. If you're faithful to Christ all you Roman Christians that this Gospel of Mark was written for right? they're in Rome they're facing emperors like you know, Nero and Caligula and all those but, but, but they have, yeah they will be facing Caligula uh, you know, they're facing all those guys. Here's what you need to know. Those who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be blessed. Well, yeah, but it says persecuted. Enough, enough, enough. Right, so there's the background. Jesus goes home. You'd think, wouldn't you? He'd been off preaching out, you know, he'd been around the place facing all these people and doing all this stuff. You think when he went home he'd have a bit of a break. Yeah? No. It's not like that. It's not like that. Jesus went <coughs> home. And a crowd gathered so that they were not able to eat. This is madness, isn't it? Not able to eat. And when his family heard this, they went out to restrain him, for they said He's lost the plot. He's lost the plot. Jesus is not on what you'd expect to be a hostile situation. He's in a situation that God had carefully chosen for him with people we know God chose because they were godly. His mother. From all we know of these people that God put, them, put him with as, as earthly parents, they're poor people but they're godly people. They're familiar with the workings of the Jewish religion. They try to keep its precepts and regulations in spite of the fact it's been made very hard for them by the bigwigs. And no doubt they are properly in awe of the constituted religious authorities who are hostile to Jesus. That's the big issue at the moment. Did you get that? You know, they, they try to be tidy people. They try to go chapel, yeah? And they're in awe of the Gwynny dog. You know, he's the Gwynny dog. Right? Or, you know, like my, my father's mother always did, when in fear of the priest. There's his situation. So now you can begin to see the bind there in when Jesus is doing all these things. Because they're in, they're in fear of the authorities, the religious authorities. They're trying to show proper respect and be tidy. And their son is doing this. See the point? Mary, stuck with that, seems to be by now without a husband to help her with that. What would you do? 
you a son raised to be a good lad work with his hands go to synagogue takes on a role way above his station in a socially economically politically troubled society and he draws crowds fulfilling a ministry for which he has not studied he has not been to Bible college he is not ordained and which annoys intensely the existing bigwigs because God is in it and they can't bear that so verse 20 Jesus goes amongst his own people and he draws crowds the like of which the religious leaders the teachers of the law they do not draw that sort of crowd and he's so busy none of his crowd or his disciples not specified none of them get to eat and that is the final straw for his own people you have not your dinner you're not going out preaching you have not your dinner can you see? I mean, all right, you know, we're messing up the cultural context, but you can see the, you can see what's going to happen here. So they went out to restrain him. The way in chapter five, the people tried to restrain the gathering demoniac. Mm. They tried to restrain him. They're handling this the way they handled what they perceived as insanity, because they said exeste. That is, he's dazed, he's amazed, he's thrown out of place, his mind is out of kilter. He's come off the rails, mentally. Now there are different sorts of opposition, right? There are different responses Jesus makes to different sorts of opposition. This is not the opposition of the religious. This is not the opposition of those who are hostile to God per se, but of those who are good and meek and godly. And sometimes the most difficult opposition, personally, I've had to face, has come from the good and the godly, and it's difficult to deal with. Sometimes it comes from those you know love you. In a sense, their opposition is most hurtful because it comes from those who who are very well intentioned it is most hurtful because of their relationship to Jesus it is own people physically opposing him but they are outside the Jesus movement which means they are only his own people in a very limited physical sense Jesus knows what he's saying when he teaches that a man's enemies will be those of his own household brother will betray brother to death And that's a reality around the world today. How painful is that? But in this case, you see, Jesus facing devastating, upsetting opposition. It's not malicious opposition. It is, it is, it is opposition that doesn't understand. They don't get it. Now, we've got to perceive that difference, right? Just because somebody's wrong, that doesn't mean they're wicked. <laughs> For the trouble, if somebody's wrong, we treat them like they're wicked. Does that make sense? They might be, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily follow from that. And this opposition doesn't understand. And how does he understand it? Even when it is sounding most rational, boy, you've got to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He simply doesn't allow himself to be distracted by it. He won't be distracted by it. And the consequences of that at first look quite damaging. What, what his family perhaps wanted most to avoid is what actually happens next with the next wave of opposition. Because they've tried that lovingly, caringly and so on, and he's just... Yeah, I love you, mum. <laughs> and kept on, you know? The bad news is that next knocking at the door is the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, okay? <clears throat> the Jewish leaders, the scribes, have come down from Jerusalem. And here's the second thing. And, and they're coming along and they're poking their noses in is really bad news. Okay, that's bad news for the family. The family had acted beforehand because they really wanted to avoid trouble with the Spanish Inquisition or its first century Palestinian equivalent, okay? A few things to note here quickly. The experts in the law, that's who he's up against now, different ball game, different, different clientele, watch how he reacts differently. They come down from Jerusalem and they, ah, not even the local scribes then. This is the boys from, you know, the big boys, right? Watch it, they are dodgy, right? He is possessed from Be by Beelzebul, they said, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. Well, they got the qualifications, they got the fancy togs, they're the boys who are bound to know. I mean, tidy little, you know, pious people living in the back end of, Jerusalem, uh, of Palestine, they ought to just listen a bit. Well, they're the guys who know, oh yeah? So Jesus calls them and he speaks to them in parables. He speaks to them in parables quite often so that 
they've got nothing against him, you know, these guys. When he's telling parables with this lot, he's being careful that they don't have some leverage on him, but he's telling them the truth. It's direct, it's confrontational. How can Satan cast out Satan, you muppets? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not be able to stand. Doesn't that make sense? He's arguing from what is known to what they really don't understand. And possibly, quite possibly, he's doing it for the sake of the people who are listening, who will be easily led by those who are supposed to know. I mean, the Archbishop said that. He's supposed to be right, isn't he? Yeah, he'd be right. It could be complete tosh. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not be able to stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan rises against himself is divided, he's not able to stand. And his end has come. What has Jesus been preaching since chapter 1, verse 15? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Turning back the kingdom of darkness. Son, your sins are forgiven. Get your bed and go home. Gosh. Jesus has been demonstrating this truth. And there he says, look, that is the significance of what you're seeing. Does that make sense in the context? first point oh next point no one is able to enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man then he can thoroughly plunder his house what are you seeing when these guys are healed when when all this stuff goes on the, the blind see the lame walk the guys bed gone what's happening satan's work is being undone his treasury his his what he's gained the brokenness that he's created to his own pleasure in the lives of human beings, he's being despoiled. You can't do that unless you tie up the strong man. King of God's at hand. Satan is being thrown out. Watch. See. Understand. And then he says, turning directly to them, no more parables. Third thing, I tell you the truth. People will be forgiven for all sins. You've just seen that in chapter 2, boys. You know, hole in the roof. Yeah, fantastic. Off he goes. You've just seen that happen. Even all the blasphemies you utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Is guilty of an eternal sin. An eternal sin. How does he identify the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? What have they just done? They've said that that which the Spirit of God is doing is the devil at work. You go on doing that, there's no forgiveness for your sins. See, even those people who come into church, and they've been converted, but basically they've got a habit in bad language, you know what I mean? <coughs> Some of us do. They, they are forgiven. But you go on blaspheming the Holy Spirit, putting yourself outside the kingdom of God by attributing to the devil what God has done, there's no hope for you. Making sense? Is everybody happy about that one? Because people get in a stew about it. You all okay with that? Jesus is taking no prisoners and I'm cracking through my notes without using them, which is always the best way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you, can even <laughs> you can even blaspheme against the Son of Man, right? The Son of Man is the figure from Daniel chapter 7 who shares the throne with the Ancient of Days. God can take it. You can even slight his authority and be forgiven for that sin. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit by saying that this which is clearly of God is not but is of the devil, forget it. Now let me be very controversial because you like it when I am. I have recently read a lot of stuff coming out of you know, that little country across the pond that talks to us a lot, um, <clears throat> out of the States, about manifestations of the Spirit, about um, not just the loopy stuff, but denying the possibility that God should be actively at work liberating souls today, right? Now be careful. Be careful of the blasphemy of the Spirit and be careful of those who, who promote that and pursue it. Just be careful. We were in a meeting the other day where, um, you know, the blasphemy of the Spirit could, we didn't get there, but it could have been coming from the other end, from the, from the very charismatic end, right? Because sometimes things are done there and you think, hey, oh, oh. this gets pretty close to blasphemy of the Spirit. We'll watch this, right? But it comes from the other direction too, okay? It comes from the hardline cessationist direction and we've got to watch that too. So be careful. In the middle there, God's truth lies, right? Somewhere in the middle. Uh, let's just be careful, because that is a very, 
that's a very clear warning, isn't it? Serious one. What about these guys who are giving this opposition to Jesus? Are they sinning in ignorance? They're the guys who've studied the law, right? They're the guys who are supposed to know. They're the guys who make the law hard work for everybody else. Are they sinning in ignorance? They're not. So how does Jesus deal with them? There you go. Take that. Does he go to their complicated legal arguments and all their stuff? He could have done that. He could have done it easy. He just goes, let's have a bit of sense here, boys. Hang on. Let's just have a bit of sense. It, it feels like, you know, the burger van on a Monday or, or the mart on a, on a Wednesday or Thursday. You know, hang on, boys. Does that make sense to you? Just, you know. Sensible argument? Arguing from what people know to what they don't. That's a cracker. You know, okay, they, they are not ignorant, but they haven't seen. They haven't got it. They should know. They profess to know. And the worst thing is, they lead other people to not believe. So Jesus is not going to leave them where they are. It's not that he's upset. It's not that he's offended. It's not that his emotions are tied up in this and he feels criticised and ooh, gets on his high horse, right? What it is, is this has implications for the kingdom of God. Now I'll talk to you. And he's pretty plain and clear. And that's how he deals with that level of religious, we're in the know, yes you're not, opposition. Does that make sense? How very different from his family. How very different from those who, you know, are pious, but they don't get it. Guys, we really got to be careful with this, how we, re how we relate to opposition and criticism. We've got to look behind it. See what I was saying about spanners and works? What's actually going on here? And then do what serves the interests of the kingdom of God and the salvation of souls and the liberation of the lost. Yeah? Make sense? Really, we've got to get on top of that. Because too often I find people who are alienated from church, God, religion, gospel, because that's not what's happening in any given context. Is that, is that making sense to everybody? You know, throw something at me if you're getting really angry by now, but I, I think I'm safe enough by now. That's all right. There's only cushions anyway. Okay. So, that's the, the second incident. Uh, just let me get through a few of these. Ah, there we go. No, no, that's not it. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. If it's coming from innocent ignorance, Jesus got a different response, didn't he? But these are the religious guys who are saying, we're right and that's wrong, and, you know, that's not God. And, and that's, we've got to perceive all those differences is what we're trying to, trying to learn from this passage because it, it's obvious to me that it's there. You know, Jesus is making different responses to opposition. Okay, finally, and, and less, uh, <coughs> less at length than that. Um, first opposition, uh, pattern of opposition was from people who cared for Jesus, were pious, as far as we know about them, and trying to do things for the right reasons, but they were not actually following Jesus. They were a distraction. Personally, emotionally upsetting, but with the best intentions. Right? And no doubt they were also a little bit afraid of the ruling authorities, the Jewish authorities, the Roman authorities, in days of disquiet and disruption in the state. And Jesus is simply not deflected by their intervention. Not deflected. He keeps moving on. Second pattern of opposition, very different, as we were saying, coming from those who purported to know, who should have known better, who were a much more real risk of teaching people away from the gospel, who were attributing the incoming kingdom of God to evil and demonic agency. And they were doing all that deliberately, and Jesus responds very differently to those people. Uh, he exposes their flaws in their arguments. He, he argues from what's known, known to what's not known. He teaches truth that will seal the hearts of their hearers against the error they're trying to lead people into. It's a battle worth fighting. They're not just outside the followers of Jesus with good intentions. They're outside with bad intentions, trying to keep other people out too. Take them on. Just take them on. And finally, the family come back on the scene. This is getting really dangerous now for the family, as far as they perceive it. The scribes have failed, right? He's not listening even to the scribes who come down from Jerusalem. The scribes have failed. They perhaps fear the stakes are therefore raised. Perhaps their fears of the consequences of what's happened are greatly heightened. And their persistence in distracting him is going to need to be addressed. And we're about to see why. Jesus' mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent word to him to summon him. Come here, son. Right. Jesus is a good Jewish boy. He's got good Jewish parents. 
he's got a good Jewish audience. Well, you know, a few dregs thrown in, but just go with me on this one. What is his responsibility when his parents summon him? What is the responsibility of a good Jewish boy to his parents? Jesus is about to look, if he's not very careful, he's about to look as if he is in fundamental breach of basic Old Testament law about how a son should relate to his mum and dad. Dad's not there anymore, but mum. Now we know he loves his mum because when he's hanging on the cross, he says to John, the dearly beloved disciple, he says, please look after my mother. Look after my mother. We know he loves his mum. How's he going to deal with this? Mark consistently portrays the physical family of Jesus as outside the circle of his followers. He knows what that feels like. And in verses 20 to 21, they were outside. Again, they're standing outside. And that word outside is getting some emphasis here in this passage of Scripture. In Mark's Gospel, they remain, because Mark is brief and to the point. He doesn't, you know, get any more developed than that. They stay outside the Jesus movement. His family stay outside right throughout Mark's Gospel. They are at best sceptical onlookers. And their outsidership is what's completely underlined here, isn't it? They're outsiders. Mark, the Lord's brother, is going to be very prominent in the Jerusalem church uh, through, through the middle years of the first century. James. James, the Lord's brother. Mark? Hmm? Too tired. Which makes this outsiderness now really odd. He's going to be key. He's going to be a crucial man. But there they are at this point, outside, summoning Jesus away from what he does in God's name. We, we, we have to be very clear with our families. We love them. We care for them. But the kingdom of God has priority. If you want to tell me that hurts, I can tell you that hurts from my young experience as a Christian. I can tell you that hurts like crazy. This summoning Jesus from the outside begins to exert influence on the group in the inside. Jesus' mother came. Jesus' brothers came. They are asserting that his very successful ministry is madness. You are mad. Humanity tends to explain the things it can't understand in terms of madness, doesn't it? Things it feels threatened by. And people tend to seek solace and comfort for their own cognitive failure, their failure in understanding, by attributing madness to things they simply don't get. Be ready for that. Be kind to that. But it looks like mud is being slung at the gospel, you know, so Jesus is going to respond. He can't have that. And he can't have that because... Um, there are Jewish obligations to family. But these guys are going to get handled very, very differently to the way he handles the scribes. He'll respond by teaching a truth that they don't get yet. And this is very important because that emphasis of Old Testament on family and obedience is very clear. Jesus has to redefine something for people. He has to redefine the fundamental nature of, of family. Family finds its origin in the family of God. Jesus has come proclaiming in the most urgent way that the kingdom of God is at hand, that everyone should repent and believe the gospel and express that by the sort of repentant lifestyle that, that chooses to leave all that encumbers a person and follow him. Where were the boats and where were the nets and where were James and John's father on the beach left behind? Now that can be an implication. When family distract here is the consequence. Doing the will of God makes you family with Jesus. It doesn't mean you walk away from your family. It doesn't mean you neglect them. It doesn't mean you've got to cut them off. But it means that primarily we're family of God. I'm adopted son of the King of Kings. And distracting a person from that is a matter so serious, Jesus says, hang on. Do you want to be unfamilied? The most important thing that we could ever want for our children is not that they put mum and dad first, but that they put following Jesus first, and it's going to cost them the way it cost us. The most important thing we can want for them is that they would prioritize following Jesus. <clears throat> I've had this conversation with Ben, because it's quite possible one of these days he's not going to be there when his old man pegs it. How's he going to feel about that? We've all got things in our own experience, perhaps, that make us think, ooh, that's a bit of a sensitive issue. I have. 
because I'm <laughs> oh, in mind. But uh, yeah, I said, listen, son, pride of what you're doing, paying a price for doing it, see you in glory. You know? We've got to prioritize our kids following Jesus. And Jesus just says, look, guys, the important thing is that the one who does the will of God is, is the one who's my brother and sister and mother. And we've got to prioritize the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is at hand and you need to repent and believe the gospel because the, the consequences of not are eternal. How do you deal with opposition? He has gently taught them a most difficult, difficult, difficult thing to have. That is a hard thing to live with. Okay, big question. How do you deal with opposition then? This is where we started, this is where we're going to finish. It won't be long now, we're done. Okay? How do you deal with it? Jesus consistently handles it in this passage with a clear eye to where it is coming from and to the threat or otherwise that it poses to people believing the gospel, being led and encouraged to trust the gospel or distrust the gospel because that's going to have eternal consequences beyond anything we can imagine. Jesus views opposition not through the lens of the hurt or the upset it costs him. He's bigger than that. But in terms of the impact of this issue on the advance of the gospel. It's a gospel issue. Let's turn it for gospel ends. Jesus is not reluctant to either let it go without being distracted from his purpose or to take it on decisively, determinedly. Actually, he destroys those scribes who have come down from Jerusalem completely. Guys, let's have a bit of sense, yeah? We all know this. We all know that. Look. Come on, don't be a wally. It's not about how it makes him feel. It's not about what he personally wants to do to the person or persons who are opposing him. It's a matter of, well, where's God going with this one? What are the implications for eternity? We've got to be careful because there's a tendency, isn't there, for opposition to make people think there must be something in it. Even if reality, there, there's nothing in the opposition, you know? Seems to be the way our society works. I wonder how things went next for Jesus. See, if a man's nearest and dearest after the flesh don't support his ministry, and if the studied and learned experts, experts in the religion that, that, that he's got there don't support him, surely this opposition must have made some of Jesus' newly found followers also wonder if he could really be from God. And the answer is it proves that he is. Which may well be why Jesus turns immediately next to the parable of the soils. And the responses that you get to the word of God and the opposition and the rejection that arise from that. Does that make sense? It might do. We'll have to have a look and see next time.